five seconds. Okay. Three, two, one, go. <laughs> Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, all the Digital Futures um, special guests. Um, and I think it's a great honor today. We invited a very interesting three friends uh, coming to this platform. Uh, Sigrid uh, Aronances, Philip Brock, and Chris Williams. So I'm Philip Yuan. It's a great honor to um, moderate uh, the speech tonight. I think it's really special because um, uh, the three special guests all uh, have a background as a structural engineer, but uh, they really play very important roles, not only in the engineer uh, research field, but also in the architecture design and, and integration between architecture design and the structural engineer. So shell structure are the key topic tonight. And shell structure um, as a structure system has been known for the elegant forms and structure integrity. The shape of the structure depends on flow of forces and vice versa. Recent years have been a renaissance of the shell structure through advance in computational design, uh, computational form finding, and digital fabrication methodology. Thanks to uh, all these advances, both engineers and architects actually enable to conceive and build beautiful and, and thin shell structure. What are the latest development with shell structures and how might this influence the way how we design and make the construction process more meaningful? I think this section brings together a group of leading architects and engineers who are experts on shell structure and discuss this possibility. So our first guest today, and um, uh, I want to make a brief introduction is, at the moment, The Sigrid um, Arizonsons, Arizon, uh, uh, maybe my pronunciation is not good, uh, who is a structure engineer specialized in form finding and optimization of structures. She is an uh, associated professor at the Department of Civil Engineer, uh, Environmental Engineering at Princeton University, USA, where he, she direct, directs the form finding lab. Sigrid holds a PhD in lightweight structure from University of Bath, UK, and work as a project engineer and Jane uh, Wernick Associates in UK London, and uh, who is also the NAE uh, class partners in Brussels, Belgium. Sigrid research focuses on lightweight surface uh, systems and how they can be optimized and realized as uh, to, to in, uh, interact with extreme structure and environmental loading. This uh, includes research on the flex, flexible and rigid shell and plates, and also the flexible membranes and nets, and mathematicals with applications for the uh, resilience urban environment. So she will give us a, a speech. The topic will be shells forming structure. Actually, I, I know a, great, a secret name from the, the bending, shell, uh, bending, uh, bending Shell, which is a, a very important book written by both you and uh, Philip Rock. I think that's really uh, influential globally. And our second uh, speaker will be Philip Rock, who is a professor at the Institute of uh, Technology and in Architecture at ETH, uh, Swish, where she co-directs the Brock uh, Research Group, um, BRG, together with uh, Tom uh, uh, Van Meller. Uh, he, is direct, he is also director of Swiss National Center of um, uh, comp uh, comp uh, Competence in uh, Research, NCCR, in Digital Fabrication, and find, uh, finding partner of uh, ODB Engineering. And Fitbrock actually uh, play a very important leading roles globally, and uh, not only uh, in Europe, but also uh, he have uh, uh, he he also teaching uh, visiting teaching in Tongji University in MIT. I think it's global play global influence from uh, the platform Rhinovolt. Uh, he uh, actually developed with his group in the past few years. So uh, within the NCCR, he also uh, uh, leading a team of researchers develop innovative structuring um, uh, uh, structure researches, uh, special focus on the prefabrication strategies and the novel construction paradigms employing digital fabrication. He also will make a speech today. The topic will be rethinking concrete shells. 
And Chris Williams, uh, also a very big name. We, uh, I, I actually know his name <laughs> for a long time. Uh, he is an uh, uh, artistic professor of architecture and civil engineering at uh, Chalmers Uni University of Technology in uh, Gothenburg, Sweden, and who works for Arup in the 1970s. Well, the Arup, he, he actually was involved in the Manhattan multi-hole project, which is um, a, a phenomenon uh, project uh, globally, uh, play very important roles from the pre-digital to also the digital uh, uh, design methodology uh, globally, who is also a pioneer timber, timber grid and design designers. And also um, um, he coordinated in a lot of very in, in, uh, important projects, including the, uh, the big shell in London Museum. And his research hinges on the relationship between the geometry and the structure actions as applied to towers, bridges, and fabric and shell structures, as well as uh, response of this flexible structure to wind. His work in the generation of structure form through the biological and also other uh, ana uh, analogies uh, has led to the collaboration on the projects, including the Free Autos multi hole uh, Green Shell project in Manhattan and also uh, the, 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 the British Museum we mentioned. So he will give a speech uh, today to um, what do you need to know to be an engineer and an, or an architect in the digital future. So uh, I think that's a very brief um, background introduction. So uh, because uh, my, my screen cannot be shared, uh, sorry for that, but I want to, uh, to give the screen firstly to um, Sigrid. So would you like to um, make your speech firstly and one by one afterwards, we may can make a discussion uh, after your, your three uh, uh, presentation. So Sigrid, would you like to start? Okay, uh, all right, can you hear and can you see my screen and hear me? Yes. Okay, great, then I'm gonna go ahead. Well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this uh, exciting platform. It's a interesting time and uh, you know, platforms like this offer the opportunity for us to connect and talk about things that we are very passionate about, which is in this case, um, shells. So I would like to thank the organizer, Philip and uh, Neil. And um, I've also invited a couple of friends. So I also say hi to um, the members of my form finding lab, the IASS workgroup five on concrete uh, shells and uh, the ACE uh, committee on aesthetics in design. So my name is Sigrid Adriansens and, um, hold on, let me see where this works. It looks like this. Okay, about uh, 10 years ago, I was working for uh, an engineering design consultancy in Brussels, uh, Name Partners, and we were involved with a competition for this building. This building is the Dutch Marine Museum. It's a 17th century uh, building, but today it's a museum. And with the renovation of the museum, um, there was a competition to build or propose a row roof over the courtyard. So basically this is a plan view of the same building. And as you see, it's actually not one building, it's four buildings that are uh, forming a rectangle. And in the middle, there is a courtyard. And so there was a competition to uh, cover um, the courtyard so that it could be used also when it's raining or snowing uh, in Amsterdam. This is a project in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. And so um, for the design of this roof, we drew inspiration from the building itself. The building uh, holds a museum about the history of uh, the Dutch as a seafaring nation. And this map was in the museum. It's a 16th century sea chart that shows what the Dutch thought the world looked like. So this is a representation of earth. Um, but also you see that, you know, and, but basically the part on the, on the left-hand side, they didn't really get that very right. But also you see that on this map, there is a geometric uh, pattern. There's lots of lines and it is uh, asymmetric that pattern. And basically it represents a map of wind roses. So basically the Dutch thought that the wind was blowing from those points and then radiating out. Now we thought that was an interesting uh, pattern and we wondered whether we could use that in the design of uh, the roof that we were supposed to be designing. The roof was supposed to be very lightweight and let in a lot of light. So basically a glass steel um, roof. And so this is how we imagined 
um, that roof, at least uh, the frame or the grid of uh, the roof to look like. But of course, as you know, the, you cannot really span very long distances with flat um, uh, structural systems because this is about uh, 30 meters. Uh, so the length and, and the depth uh, or the, the, the width of the courtyard is about 30 meters. So um, we then uh, developed uh, an approach to make this into um, a, a grid shell. So basically we modeled this as a system of springs with nodes, we applied loads. And basically if you let the system like that hang, it becomes a hanging chain model. And it was Robert Hooke who said that if you take that and you turn it upside down, you end up with a very efficient structure, which is a compression only um, system. And um, Chris, who's also on this panel, also worked on this project because the other challenge that we had um, with this project was that not all the um, polygons on this mesh were triang triangular and we wanted to clad it with glass. So we also had to uh, uh, come up with an algorithm that would play, uh, make all the facets planar. And, and Chris was very much involved uh, with that or, or mainly led that. So here we won the competition so many years forward. Here is the building constructed from above. Uh, it's a very lightweight uh, system. We had to take into account that we couldn't put any horizontal thrust on the walls because obviously they had not been designed in the 16th century to take horizontal thrust. Um, it also, the, the well, the, the shell is a big success. It won many architectural prizes and people just love it. It also features on the book that um, Chris, uh, Philip and I, uh, and then also Diedrich, uh, published in 2014, Shell Structures for Architecture, Form Finding and Optimization. And uh, this is what it looks like on the inside when you're lying on your back uh, in the museum, you see uh, this, and I hope that you recognize the pattern that you saw on the map. And uh, what we did at the node, so basically where different structural elements co connect together, we put uh, LED. So basically at night, it looks like, uh, maybe it looks like a starry night, a little bit like the, the map that we saw. And it reminds you maybe of how the Dutch were going, uh, you know, on all the oceans and exploring um, the world. So when I was working on this project, that made me kind of think that actually shell structures are, and this is a grid shell structures, are very fantastic structures because they're indeterminate. That means that, you know, if some members break, that's okay because, you um, the, the forces will flow, will find a way through the other members. Um, so that's actually good. It's also, if it's well designed, so we use a hanging chain model, um, it is very efficient. That means that your members can be very small. That means that this is an economic structure um, and also that it's an environmentally friendly structure because we are not using that much material. And the third thing that I start thinking, which is very interesting, is that actually it's a very stiff structure. And that is due because of its curvature. It's not due because there's a lot of material there. It's really because it is curved, that it is stiff. And that is, of course, for the roof, a desirable characteristic. Now, there are uh, many structures, many shell structures that uh, resist uh, very extreme loading. And so, you know, I have many pictures like this of uh, domes and cupolas that are the that withstand, for example, tornadoes, you know, top left picture is a, uh, actually that's a, a hurricane, uh, sorry, that's an earthquake, um, left bottom picture is a tornado, uh, in the middle bottom is uh, in Florida, that's a, um, that's a very big um, hurricane that it survived on the right hand side, San Francisco, so it seems that these domes and shell structures are really good at taking extreme loading and not there had not been actually there hadn't been really done much research into why that is why do these structures stand up whereas all the other structures in the in their neighborhood uh, kind of collapse so we wanted to investigate that and uh, we investigate that on uh, this uh, beautiful shell structure it's a shell structure from the 1950s it's felix candela's church of our miraculous metal it consists of a number of hyperbolic parabolites that are uh, repeated and this uh, structure uh, you know didn't undergo any damage in the 1985 earthquake which was an eight uh, uh, on the richter scale eight uh, earthquake so very large earthquake um, so we modeled this in a finite element and um, we did a statistical dynamic dynamical analysis to see uh, which of the eigenmodes is actually contributing um, to uh, this very good performance. And what we kind of found out is that the first eigenmode is very high. 
uh, as you and the eigenfrequency of the earthquake is very low. So the, the eigenfrequency you see it here. This is a response uh, spectrum um, from Mexico City, and we see that at 0 0.5 hertz, the earthquake is shaking, and the the shells um, eigenfrequency, the first one, is at 3.09 hertz. So that means that this is a very very stiff structure. Uh, and so when the earthquake starts shaking, it will actually, the uh, structure will not resonate uh, with it. There will be no resonance. So why is this system so stiff? Well, you see here on the left-hand side, that is a, a natural frequency is a function of K, which is the stiffness of the system divided by M, the mass. And of course, uh, for shell structures, K, the stiffness is very high. That is due to the curved form and M, the mass is very low. So that makes that you actually end up with a very high um, eigenfrequency that makes that you end up with a very stiff system, which is really good at uh, resisting earthquake loading and all these other extreme loadings because those frequencies are much lower. So we were interested in, uh, can we do more? Can we do more? Because usually when we do form finding for shells, we uh, form find them for uh, self weight, which is the most dominant weight. But what if we also take into account um, earthquake loading in this case. Earthquake loading is not a vertical load, not a gravity load, it's a horizontal load. And so uh, we did this first for arches. Um, we established uh, using graphic statics, uh, what would be the trust line uh, in an arch uh, if you have both self-weight and earthquake loading. Uh, the blue line that you see is a trust line just under gravity. So a trust line is a theoretical line that represents the uh, compressive forces that are uh, going down in the arch. And uh, the green line is the line that when, when you add self-weight and earthquake loading, you end up with this green line. And so Mosley said that um, if you can find in your arch, uh, a uh, if, if, you, if your trust line is in your arch, in the thickness of your arch, then you will have a stable system. So uh, of course your earthquake can come from left to right or it can go from right to left. So uh, basically what you have to do is you have to take this trust line and mirror image it. Then we offset it a little bit because of course you need to have um, a base. Um, and then if you take the envelope um, of that uh, figure, you end up with the ideal shape for an arch under self-weight and um, earthquake loading. And we kind of checked um, using virtual work and indeed it showed that uh, you know, this system, this structure will collapse under uh, 0.3 G, which is you know, what we take for um, earthquake loading. Of course, we don't really build arches that much. Um, and of course, this arch also has like a changing thickness, although that's not such a problem with additive uh, manufacturing. It's not uh, easy to build this out of uh, standardized uh, volumetric elements like blocks or bricks. So um, another way that we could use this is actually to extrude this and uh, make this into a shell because we are really ultimately interested in shell structures. So what you see here is going from A to F is um, a sequence of how you can go from an arch that is uh, excellent under self-weight and um, gravity loading, you mirror image it, then you offset it with a certain periodicity um, and then you loft a surface through it and you end up with uh, the shell here uh, at the bottom right F which is a shell that supposedly is very good under earthquake loading. Now, you might think that's a weird shell. Well, actually these kind of shells uh, exist. In the 1980s, Eladio Dieste in Uruguay built shells like the ones that you see here on the left-hand picture. This is a corrugated, uh, very thin concrete shell. Uh, it looks very similar to the shell that we actually discovered in our research. And you see a picture of that 3D, of a small model, 3D printed on the right-hand side. Um, so these shells have been um, constructed, but uh, we were interested in seeing, okay, now we have corrugations, we have uh, a depth uh, to our shells, how do these behave? So we now carried out a nonlinear pushover analysis. So that basically means that we are putting uh, a, a force, a horizontal force, and we increase it gradually and then see how these systems start cracking because we assume in our models that these are concrete. And we see that we either have, uh, we always have four hinges occurring just like in the arch, uh, but those hinges occur at different places. Either they occur four at the, at the lower part of the shell, such as in case FF1, or uh, we have three occurring at the lower part and one at the top of the crown, such as for example, in FF4. 
um, you see here that there the hinge, the cracking really also occurs at sea. And so what does that make, whether you get hinges occurring at the sides or at the top, that is a function of your corrugation depth. If you see your corrugation depth in, for example, um, FF2, FF5, they're all very small, whereas uh, the ones that have the, uh, the, the hinges occurring at the sides is, for example, FF1 and FF5, the ones with much larger corrugation depths. So um, basically what we see is that we get hinges or cracking occurring at at these places, either at the crown or at a fourth up. And that is really in our geometry, the place where we get single curvature. So all the other places, so not where the red lines, but in all the other areas, your curvature is double curvature. So that means it's curved like this, or it's curved like this. You have curvature in the two directions that makes the shell super stiff. In the areas where you have single curvature, that is where those red arrows are. So basically in the one direction, the, there is no curvature, it's a straight line, and the other um, direction you have curvature. Those areas are not so stiff. Uh, they will uh, bend more and therefore they will start cracking more. And that's why you have those hinges occurring at those places. And then just to do an analysis of all different kinds of corrugation depths, et cetera, et cetera. On the left-hand side, you see the este shell, and then you see a parametric study that we carried out for the same kind of shell with the same amount of volume. But now the only thing we vary is either the corrugation depth or the corrugation um, periodicity. And we see that all shells, FF1 all the way to FF5, perform much better than um, the DSD shell, right? The DSD shell starts cracking at about 0.19 G, whereas all the other shells, uh, you know, the first cracks occur at, at much higher, higher accelerations. And we see that uh, FF3 is actually the shell that performs the best, right? Um, that shell will, uh, uh, you know, collapse at 0 0.5, um, uh, 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 0 0.5 G. Um, and so basically that means that you know, like all the shells have the same volume of material, but the way that you make the corrugations is going to give your shell much superior performance, right? So FF3 is performing much better than the DSA shell. Uh, and the only thing that is different is the periodicity depth and the periodicity, um, uh, the depth, the periodicity and the depth and the corrugation depth. So those are very important. Things And so basically this shows that this is totally a function of form uh, to get much better uh, performance under um, earthquakes. This is what such a structure could look like. This is put in uh, San Francisco. The, the problem of course with shells is that they are very hard to construct. And so I'm also interested in construction techniques. We looked at um, Brunelleschi's dome in, uh, in Florence, in Italy. It was completed in 1436 uh, by the genius of Filippo Brunelleschi who was a goldsmith and a clock uh, maker. He spent many years working on this dome that you see here in the background. Of course, also have to bear in mind, this is the 15th century. This shell is in a seismic region in Italy. It's still standing up today. It's a super durable system. Um, but there are rumors that this um, dome was built without scaffolding. And um, people know this and have actually written books about this, but nobody's actually discovered how could that possibly be. And Brunelleschi didn't really uh, leave any writing behind to discuss how this uh, fantastic dome was built without scaffolding. There are drawings like these ones here. These are drawings from the um, uh, um, fr uh, from Antonio da, da Sangalo. Uh, and what you see here, that's actually, um, it's a double dome, a double skin dome, interior dome. I'm looking here at the, pic at the left hand picture, top uh, bottom right. You see there, there's a cross section, it's actually two domes. The inner dome is constructed first and then serves as scaffolding or prop work for the outer dome. So we are interested in the inner dome. How can you construct this inner dome without any form work, no supports during construction? Um, <coughs> the other thing that's remarkable is that on these domes, you see these patterns of spirals going up uh, on the left-hand side, you see pictures with just uh, one series of spirals. On the right-hand side, you see two spirals going up. Uh, they're not decorative. They're actually key to why the system stands up. So we discovered that uh, for, we did a study for an octagonal dome and we used discrete element analysis. Um, as you build the dome, there's two things that are important. As you're building the dome, first of all, you have to do layer per layer, like you're building an igloo. You can't build like a ladder and then another ladder and then join them together. You have to build layer per layer horizontally. And then the um, 
uh, the uh, spiraling, and actually in this case, we call it herringbone pattern, spiraling blocks that are standing up are key. So basically that are the dark gray um, bricks that you see here. Basically what happens is uh, once your dome starts kind of curving inward, uh, your bricks kind of wanna slide inwards. Eh? Because when you're building uh, vertically like a wall, you can just stack them on top of each other. But from the moment that your uh, dome starts curving inwards, your bricks might st start sliding inwards. And so uh, what we found is basically when your bricks start sliding inwards, they will actually jam against these vertical upstanding bricks. And these vertical upstanding bricks, they are fixed in the layer below. So basically your bricks want to slide in, but they are jammed against these upstanding um, uh, vertical bricks. And they are, those vertical bricks are stuck in the layer before. So the, the forces are transferred to the layer before into all the rings that are below that or all the courses that are below that. On the right-hand side, you see a picture uh, from discrete element analysis where you see on the top, the bricks sliding down. That is assuming that there is no friction, which would be like a Teflon coated brick that doesn't exist, of course. And on the right-hand side, uh, and at the bottom, you see from the moment that you have a, a friction angle of about uh, 10%, your bricks, you know, because of the friction and because of their uh, geometry jam against these uh, lighter gray bricks and they're kind of stuck there. And in that way, you can construct a dome without any uh, formwork. So th this was a, you know, important, nice paper that we published this year. Um, of course, I'm interested in historic things, but all, I'm always looking forward, like, how can we use these techniques um, today? Um, how can we use these uh, form finding techniques, how can we use these techniques of self-balancing for the construction of um, shells uh, with drones or robots. And I had the great fortune of working with uh, SOM, the American Engineering for SOM and uh, the CREATE uh, lab uh, who focuses on uh, uh, robots in uh, architecture at Princeton University. And uh, we worked on a nice project. I'm gonna show you a, a video that shows the project that we um, did. So basically we looked at how can we use patterns and form to construct a vault without any formwork. So there is nothing supporting the vault during construction. The only support that there is, is uh, the, the robots. We have two robots that are working together. One is placing uh, the brick and the other one is holding the shell just in one point. Um, the work that we did uh, in this project is basically um, validating that the shell is stable during all phases uh, of construction and advising on where the um, robot should uh, support the shell. So I'm going to stop this presentation and I am now um, going to show you a video. Just a second. I don't make, oh, uh, share screen. Yes. Let's see. Oh, no, we're back on, on the old one. Hold on, I forgot how to do this. Um, okay, wait, uh, share screen. Okay, so uh, this is a four uh, minute video that I'm going to show. It was made by uh, the Create Lab. So that's people, basically the people that um, uh, did all the path planning and the optimization of the robots, but I think you will enjoy it. So first you see the construction of small scale prototypes in the lab with smaller robots, but none of them uses additional supports. And here you see the uh, robotic uh, planning and here we're, they're building a, a prototype at a larger scale. The construction of the central arch is the most important part in this um, construction to guarantee the stability of the shell throughout the entire process. So that was a, a wooden prototype. Now we move on to bricks, bricks and mortar, or uh, in this case, actually bricks and uh, epoxy glue. 
So all these are done at the uh, Create Robotic Lab in uh, Princeton, these experiments. So these prototypes consist both of concrete and glass bricks because the idea was to uh, build the final prototype out of uh, glass bricks. So uh, this prototype was built for an exhibition in London uh, where SOM holds uh, an exhibition to showcase their projects. And you see here the construction of the central arch. This is, the, this is really the key structural part of the construction. Once you get the arch right, you can build out of that. The wonderful thing about robots is that they, um, obviously they can place things in a very precise position, but also they can hold them for a very long time. Unlike uh, people, people can't really hold a brick for a very long time or cannot really support the structure. That's also the other thing they can support the, um, the he, this is a very important uh, moment where the, the arch is about uh, three quarters built and the robot is supporting it in one point and the other robot uh, keeps adding um, bricks to it. As you see, no scaffolding, no uh, formwork. It's my PhD student, Edward Brun. Okay, that brings me to the end of my uh, presentation. Thank you very much for uh, watching and I'm sure we will discuss and answer questions afterwards. Thank you so much, Sigrid. It's great, great, uh, great work in Acadia, I think uh, in the workshop. It's a very interesting collaborative robotic uh, fabrication work. Actually, uh, right now the-, okay, the that brings me- yeah. To the end of my uh, presentation. Okay. Thank you very much for Thank uh, you so much. watching, and uh, I'm sure we will discuss and answer questions afterwards. Okay. Thank you so much, Secret. It's great, great, uh, great work in Acadia. I think uh, in the workshop, it's yeah, a great. very interesting collaborative robotic uh, mm -hmm. fabrication yeah. work. Actually, uh, right now the, the okay, that brings me. Yeah. To the end of my uh, presentation. Okay. Thank you very much for Thank you so much. Uh, watching, and uh, I'm sure we will discuss and answer questions afterwards. Okay. So right now, thank you so much. Yeah, um, yeah in Peter Billy. Great, great, uh, great work in Acadia, I think, uh, in the workshop. It's yeah, a great. very interesting collaborative robotic uh, fabrication yeah. work. Actually, uh, right now, the. the that brings me. Yeah. It seems we have a robot in the room somewhere. <laughs> it's repeating. I think Philip's. Should I go ahead uh, with my presentation? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, okay. Apologies. Right, I'm setting up. All right. Um, 
Hi everyone, uh, thanks for the invitation and it's, uh, it's, it's great to be able to um, uh, share our work again, but in a very different context with uh, two of my important and probably research wise closest colleagues uh, in the field of shells indeed. So it's great that Sigrid and Chris uh, could join today as well. And then of course, Philippe Yuan, who is uh, propagating uh, the idea of strength through geometry of uh, computational form finding of the interface of architecture and structures. And then specifically uh, in China, but then also of course is building a lot of spectacular shells himself. So it's, uh, it's, it's uh, my pleasure to be able to be part of this. Um, because it's not my first time in digital futures or dif digital futures world, I, I thought of not giving my typical lecture and maybe just kind of uh, uh, look a little bit at the uh, last decade of, of the BRG, where we have been uh, exploring uh, 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 small and bigger shells. And then uh, to give you an update on uh, maybe what's the most exciting thing going on for us uh, right now. Okay. Uh, so for me, it actually started, uh, this is a model that, that was done uh, very early on, a model with, um, uh, done with Matthias Rippmann and Lorenz Lachauer. I just arrived at ETH, and so this was uh, in my very first month. And actually, that's still, I think, one of the coolest shells that we built. It uh, was the first time that anyone 3D printed a model that stood in such, a, such, such an exciting little shape. And, and to convince that this was indeed not uh, just a trick, uh, this was our very first demolition video. And so it's, it was a good times where we started to kind of poke the shell uh, also uh, to, to uh, for us actually to excited to, to, to try to understand a bit better how, how these, uh, these structures work. And that is, uh, I put this in not only because these were our humble beginnings, but also because I still believe that uh, using uh, models on any scale, and you saw this also in Sigrid's presentation, is one of the most valuable kind of approaches to really understand how something works, and particularly in, in something as complicated as, as a shell structure. It is true that indeed now we have many more tools available to understand things, but still this fundamental hands-on kind of behavior is very exciting. So uh, continuing with models, we, we, we almost built uh, a crazy stone shell in, in, in Austin, Texas. And so these were the early works with Matthias where we, um, where we were exploring what, what could, be do, uh, could be done as a free form compression shell. Again, this project is from, from 2011 and we were lucky that Saadit Architects invited us to show this project in 2012 at the Venice Biennale. And it's actually quite funny that in exactly the same room, four years later, we got to build uh, this little structure, kind of a variation of it, but then um, uh, more than 100 times bigger. Um, uh, again, with models, uh, you can explore also, so beyond compression only. So this is a compression shell that is being very carefully balanced by a tension tie. And uh, this nice structural model here, you see Matthias very meticulously assembling it. And then uh, here we are cutting the, the tie. I, I, I don't know if you, I don't, I don't know if you hear the sound in the background, but the person that is uh, laughing and saying, this is fantastic is actually the very famous Chris Williams indeed. And uh, this was, uh, we did this little crash test when Sigrid and, and Chris were indeed in town to work on our book that we worked on together, that Sigrid showed shell structures in architecture. Uh, in parallel to the little models, actually a very first shell that I designed, engineered and built myself was uh, in uh, Addis Abeba in Ethiopia in the summer of 2010, where we kind of uh, like in the Mapungube project in South Africa, we used simple tile vaulting to build these uh, compression shells here that then were stiffened, stabilized with the soil to then make this super cheap, super uh, easy kind of uh, floor system with, with very weak materials done locally. Um, at the same time as well, so 2010 was quite a, quite a, a kick, a, a big start of my research group. We also did this first kind of freeform tile vault, very humble scale, but as you know, maybe many of these tile vaults have been built since. So this was actually for us, 
uh, for me, very exciting to show for the first time, actually, that maybe the things that I developed in my PhD, uh, trust network analysis that served as a foundation for Rhino Vault, um, could really work. And so this was testing. Uh, for me, very exciting to see this at this scale, but then also exciting to see that many people picked up not only Rhino Vault, but started to build more exciting tile vaults all over the world indeed. Also there, we did some nice uh, load testing. It seems that none of the structures that I built uh, last longer than a couple of months. Uh, but here to our frustration, the big sand. So you, you see, we actually have three tons of sandbags there. Uh, uh, stacked and uh, nothing came down. And that is where then uh, probably you've seen this video already where my research team is very happy to, to, to uh, knock something down. Again, I mean, this is obviously we had a lot of fun here, but it also shows the resilience of double curvature. It also uh, taught us a lot actually on, on, on becoming more confident about in the, indeed the strength. So beyond the simulations, it's easy to simulate things on a computer, but uh, this, this is really exciting to be able to, uh, to, to kind of uh, fully sense how the structure is working. And we pushed tile vaulting a little bit further to try to, for example, have uh, uh, linear supports combined with little mini shells in between and really trying to see if we can go beyond all the way to then the project that we designed and engineered uh, for Norman Foster for the Venice Biennale. And uh, this was then basically the gateway on the, uh, in the gardens at the end of the, of the Arsenal. So for four years, people uh, walked under this uh, prototype for uh, this drone port um, uh, that Norman Foster designed. Also there, unfortunately, this shell had to go, but that gives us then a nice opportunity to add a little video. So here you see that this, um, this little drill robot uh, guy there is uh, just taking out one support. And then after, after four years of very safe and very nice kind of uh, work, unfortunately, this shell had to go as well. So to then wrap up the story of the tile vaults, of course, actually where things really got exciting is that when the computational tools started to allow some more sophisticated topologies, like here, the overlapping shells. And these are, of course, some images uh, of the workshop that I co-taught with Philippe Yuan, where Philippe actually brought their expertise in large-scale 3D printing and large-scale bending active uh, structures in order to provide a, a very... Uh, efficient formwork and guide work to then realize this, this shell. So th this is the first larger scale shell with overlaps. And then of course, Philippe uh, took this, this concept much, much further in, in one of his beautiful shells that he built. Um, here it looks that, uh, so Philippe is for sure very excited. Uh, so Philippe Yuan, it looks that I'm excited, but I'm just uh, actually yelling at the photographer to please take a picture with, because I have crazy fear of heights and I want to basically to get off the shell again, even though um, this is a nice stable structure, of course. Um, compression shells, uh, we have also been trying to, to, to show to people that if you get the geometry right, then you can use waste such as for this project here in, in, in New York City uh, to achieve a structural form with materials that are not meant to be structural at all. And so here, this cathedral of waste. Jumping to another category of shells, not the tile vaults where you just, uh, as you also actually saw in Sigrid's kind of um, uh, robotic explorations, the tile vaults, you always have two faces that you can stitch and that gives you sufficient bending capacity to get to the next stable section. Um, uh, another type of shells is the, the stone cut uh, vault. And in fact, this is the very first stone, stone cut vault that Matthias and I uh, built with our partners Escobedo Construction that also ended up building the Venice shell. Uh, it's a very humble one, but I still like it because it's a very um, a cool kind of place for the dogs to uh, drink the water that gets accumulated in the li little basin there. Uh, so this is not that serious, but it was a nice uh, first try for us. Um, a next shell that's oh, shell, it's not really a shell, but there is a mini shell maybe hiding in there uh, is one that uh, ODB, so Oxendorf, uh, you see John Oxendorf here in the middle, you see Matt Young, the world expert in masonry modeling on the left. Uh, where we had the opportunity to actually work to uh, 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 help uh, uh, Mi Jin Yun 
and, and Eric to realize this absolutely fantastic uh, memorial uh, on the MIT campus. Um, the mini shell is actually just the little part in the middle, right? And then the rest can be seen as gigantic buttresses or flying buttresses like in a historic cathedral. And then uh, for those of you who have seen my presentation before, I particularly uh, will have heard this before. I particularly like that this uh, beautiful, elegant compression, robust shell is standing next to the Frank Gehry Center, uh, the, the Stada Center by Frank Gehry, uh, which will probably not last as long as the thousands of years that this beautiful arch will be standing. And then after the experience we kind of won, uh, gained uh, through this project, here we have 32 quite large uh, granite uh, pieces that are balanced in compression. Then we said, ah, based on these experiences, particularly I think the dark shell was very convincing experience. Indeed, we said, let's just try to blow the community away and show that this thing really works and we can really bring this back. And that's then the armadillo vault, these 399 cut stone pieces that are balanced in space uh, in equilibrium, in compression without any glue, any mortar, any reinforcement. So here you see that indeed these are just stone pieces being assembled and that then creates this, uh, this shell. Um, now we are actually, and this is actually a, a, an older video, but I show it because all of this research was, was kind of uh, instigated by Matthias, who unfortunately, as maybe many of you know, uh, uh, since passed away. But Matthias really also was pioneering to not only understand the stable sections, but also to work on the stereotomy of the, the, the different kind of voussoirs, the different kind of elements, to be able to start to assemble these shells with, um, without any support or with minimal support. You saw the support in the middle. So uh, Sigrid already said that Brunelleschi, for example, had these tiles that stuck out to the next layer. This is, of course, a very similar concept that we can now start to scale up through uh, uh, digital fabrication indeed. Then uh, shifting from compression only shells, we uh, started to venture also into concrete shells and there a, bi a big challenge is how to form them. And I put this, this very early prototype, um, uh, maybe from 2011, I think, or even earlier by Diedrich. And uh, also because Diedrich is the fourth uh, co-editor uh, of our book on shell structures for architecture, very early project where we started to use a flexible formworks in order to realize these shells. And that then led of course to uh, our proposal and our prototype for the Hilo unit, where uh, we scaled this up and we developed this kit of parts that allows actually with industry partners. So no longer in the lab, even though this is a prototype built in the lab, the entire shell had to be done by the industry partners that would then finally build this shell. So again, to give you a little bit of scale here, we are talking about 20 by 10 meters, um, seven and a half meters in height, and the shell goes from three centimeters. So in this case, it's a carbon fiber reinforced concrete shell with just one layer of carbon fiber mesh uh, to eight centimeters at the support. Always questioning ourselves and learning from our uh, successes, but also the many failures and the many challenges towards. Uh, we have also trying to see, can we rather than cut fabric, can we use uh, 3D knits? And uh, we explored this for a very little bridge here, but then of course also we scaled this up in this collaboration with uh, the architects, where we literally used the sweater to carry 50, to, uh, five tons of concrete and, to, uh, concrete and to place it exactly where it wants to be, including these uh, stiffeners running in two directions. This is of course the work of Mariana, uh, together then with Shaje Bushan and his team at Zaha Code. And uh, we realized this nice prototype in Mexico. Of course, like all our shells, this structure is no longer there. So unfortunately we cannot go visit it anymore. But then uh, what to me is maybe the strain of shells that, I, that excites me the most is when we started to use these shell geometries, these compression shells for the most banal, st uh, banal structural element ever, which is the floor. And this is our structural model, which we tested in 2012. And uh, then you see actually how thin this unreinforced concrete structure is. Um, we did many more projects there. A uh, big challenge is the shaping of these structures. Uh, there is still some questions how to do that. 
But the more we work on this, the more it gets very exciting to actually see the big impact that we could have with these kind of uh, geometries. Of course, all of this, this is the right time. We no longer have, all, now we have all the tools to, to understand all of these structural geometries, but we also have large scale digital fabrication, which allows us indeed to now scale this up very straightforwardly into large uh, floor elements indeed. And then the quick update that I wanted to give. So the HILO project is actually finally happening um, for the large roof, we are basically uh, realizing this roof with our cable net system. You see that the building site is very clean, very simple. That is because um, it is planned like that, not just because it's Switzerland. And that is one of the key things that we also want to address, not just the shaping, so the material and the efficiencies, but also the logistics and how much time it takes to go on site. So these are some pictures of the foam work that we uh, assembled. So it was actually um, uh, our research group, the BRG that assembled this foam work and then the spraying could happen. In this case, you see that there's quite a bit of fiber being included in the concrete in order not to have any visible cracks in the, uh, in the visible concrete indeed. Uh, we had to include, of course, some details to include facade profiles and so on. This, this is why for me, for me and for the BRG, this will be a milestone project because this is a real building that at least is not planned to be destroyed in a couple of months and where we really also demonstrated a fully integrated design, engineering, fabrication, construction project that allowed this crazy shell to be built without any inefficiencies. You see still a lot of discoloration that is because these pictures uh, were taken in a very small slot uh, just uh, when the shell was decentered. So now the shell looks very different, very much, much more even, but actually I like also the, the showing how the shell was built and that this is a unique kind of project. In the same project, it will also be a premiere for these floors. So for the very, uh, the, it will be the first time that these structural, unreinforced, super thin uh, concrete shell floors will be in, uh, included. Uh, these are some images of uh, the, the, the formwork being assembled. Of course, in the future, we will not do this complicated formwork, but because it's the very first time, we wanted to do this as a very clean on-site construction in order to keep the shell beautifully in compression under all loading cases. Here you see a detail of actually the tension ties that will post tension the, the shell and keep it in compression under all loading cases. Uh, the top foam work we left in, you also see that it has uh, included hydronics, uh, which actually activates this thin concrete shell as a very affecting, effective heating and cooling device. The concrete mix is quite exciting because we use 100% recycled aggregates and 50% recycled construction waste as replacement for the cement. So this is actually an extremely, albeit uh, still experimental, but an extremely uh, green concrete, um, uh, uh, taking out almost all the embodied carbon of the concrete, and then we place the material only where it needs to be. And that is, um, uh, so, that is double, double the uh, um, sustainable targets indeed. So here again, don't be, uh, don't be disappointed by the discoloration. This is exactly after the centering, but you see how clean this beautifully kind of uh, diamond shape is kind of, uh, maybe there is some similarities or it looks a little bit like the beautiful shell that Sigrid showed in, um, in, in, in Amsterdam indeed. But I wanted to uh, close up here with, with, with Rhino Vault uh, and, and Compass. Uh, so this is uh, what for us is the future. This is what we spent most of our time on. It's basically this open source Python based framework for computational research and collaboration in architecture, engineering and digital fabrication. So if you want to learn exactly how we do things, go to Compass because we are sharing most of our methods. We are sharing how things are done. The idea behind the Compass framework is create, so it's created for three main objectives. First, don't repeat yourself or others. This is being done all over the world. People are reinventing the wheel all the time. So Compass is there to actually provide state of the, the art kind of base data structures, techniques, libraries, uh, research. The second one is so that people can very easily, robustly, and for the future, 
uh, uh, share your work. So that is why we really have worked hard on making this very, uh, very compatible, very open source platform independent kind of uh, system. And then the last thing is to really stimulate and to a, a collaboration and to allow also the research to find its way much faster to industry application indeed. RhinoVault 2 is now fully embedded or kind of a packaged uh, in, uh, from Compass. So it basically uses Compass functionality and then more, more specifically TNA to get there. Since I hit my 20 minutes, I'm not going to talk about what we're doing in, in South Africa and India, but I just wanted to put this in there because for me, what is key is what is the relevance of these, what is the relevance of these shells? And for me, the relevance is really to use them where we need them the most. And so here in a South African context where we are trying to provide new, new units for the poorest of the poor, we use structural geometry to do better. Indeed, we use structural geometry to use less material, but less material is not necessarily good because you might need higher strength materials like carbon fiber and so on, not a good idea. So that is why we actually combine often or where we restrain ourselves to stick within compression vaults because then the stresses in the material are very, very low and we can use better materials in the sense of material that have significantly lower embodied uh, carbon associated to them. But as you also heard in Sigrid's talk, um, shells are ex often expensive, complicated to build. And that is where we really believe that rather than considering this as an afterthought to really embrace digital fabrication and to even go to what we call computational fabrication that you embed all the constraints of your fabrication in your design framework from the beginning. That is how you can significantly reduce the waste, but also make it much more efficient. So time-wise more efficient and realistic to realize these shells. I hope that in some of the projects that I've shown you, you can see that we're really pushing the boundaries there. And then lastly, um, if we are not going to, uh, if we are not starting to work together more in, uh, as an integrated holistic team, meaning that the architects, the engineers, but also the fabricators, the constructor, uh, con con uh, contractors are all together kind of uh, uh, pushing things forward. And that is where I really believe that with computation, we can achieve such an integration. And that is key to start to propose these kind of geometries uh, in an economic kind of way. So with this, uh, I hope that you enjoyed my slightly different presentation than what I uh, typically do but I'm super proud of our group. So the BRG, go to our website, follow us on Instagram or uh, whatever, but um, I recommend you to maybe check out some of our uh, online resources because we really believe that we are all in this world together to try to do better, to build better, to be less polluting and so on. And we are trying to be as open as possible and we share everything that we develop. So with that, thanks a lot again for the invitation and I look forward for the questions and discussion later. Thank you so much for Philip Block. We have uh, more than 4,500 audience in Bilibili. Oh, wow. I think it's a, it's a very big platform in China. And Hi, China. Uh, YouTube, <laughs> I think uh, 100, 200 people as well. Yeah. Okay, let's welcome Christoph. Christopher, Chris. Would you like to share a screen? Hello, Philip. Yes, certainly. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, good. Okay, good. Right, and can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, uh, so um, here we are. So, um, well, firstly, it's a great pleasure to be um, speaking after Sigrid and Philippe, um, both of whom I've known for, well, since they were, since they were students, so um, quite, quite, quite a long time. Um, so um, I've entitled my talk, uh, What Do You Need to Know to Be an Engineer or an Architect in the Digital Future? Um, I don't think I'm gonna answer that question, but at least I'm gonna ask it and discuss the issues that, um, that surround it. So um, I'm gonna start by just saying 
a bit about my background, um, uh, which will explain perhaps why I, I have the views that I have. So um, when I graduated, uh, I went to work for Ovarup and Partners, as they were then, they're now called Arup. Um, and I was lucky enough to be in Ted Happold's group and to work on this project, the Mannheim Multihalla. Um, uh, so that, the architect for that project, or the consultant architect for the roof was Fry Otto. Uh, Ted Happold uh, was in charge of our group at Arup, and then he subsequently um, started Bureau Happold in the late 70s, middle 70s, late 70s. Uh, the project engineer was Ian, Ian Niddle, um, who uh, again left Arup and um, started Bureau Happold with Ted. Um, so the Mannheim project was uh, interesting because it was a timber, a tim or when I say was, is, it's still there. Uh, originally it was supposed to be a temporary structure but it's still there after uh, more than 40 years. Um, it's a timber structure. And uh, from the point of view of structural action, it behaves very much like a kitchen sieve. Uh, a kitchen sieve is a woven wire mesh consisting of two sets of members uh, which cross each other uh, in exactly the same way that here we've got uh, two sets of timber members in two layers, which uh, again cross each other. Um, I won't talk in detail about the, what that means from the structural point of view, um, but if you're interested, the best thing to do is just to get hold of a kitchen sieve and to, to load it either with your hands or with bags of sugar, and you'll see that it has very interesting structural properties. Now, um, we did do some computational work on, on that design, um, the structural analysis of the roof. And um, so I used to walk up the, um, uh, to Euston Road with a deck of cards to, to run the, the analysis on a computer like this, a CDC 6600, which was a state-of-the-art computer in those days, um, but is significantly less powerful than a mobile phone is today smartphone. Now, um, the shape of the shell was um, defined by this hanging model produced by Fry Otto's team. And the idea is that this hanging model, which is a, a ch made of uh, chains, linked chains, uh, hangs purely in tension. And so uh, when you invert that shell, you end up with a, a pure compression shell, uh, which is in essence very similar to the, um, uh, the basic idea that Philippe uses in his, in his form finding method, except of course, his work is computational. Um, the, uh, the structure was built by laying out the laths flat, the straight timber laths flat, that's on the top left, and then it was lifted into place using scaffold towers and forklift trucks. Um, the bottom two pictures, so the structural model that we made in our, Af in our Arab office in Soho, uh, made of perspex strips, and you can see it being load tested on the bottom right with nails. And so we used a combination of the digital with that CDC computer and the physical modeling to establish the safety of the, of the shell. It spans about 80 meters and its structural depth is um, 150 millimeters timber. So it's an exceptionally slender structure. Um, another model here that we use, this is, this is actually modeling the erection process. It's a, again, it's a, this, a woven wire mesh and it's loaded with fishing weights and that was to give it the correct relationship between stiffness and weight in order to model the flexibility of the structure as it was lifted into shape. And as, as Philippe said, uh, physical models are still very much have a place in uh, our digital world. Now, Fry Otto was very interested in 
um, the work of Darcy Thompson, in particular his book on growth and form and, and natural analogy. So you can see the soap film there, sorry, the um, spider's web there, um, which is clearly a inspiration for Otto's probably best known work, which is the Munich Olympic Stadium. Um, Sigrid has already talked about corrugated shells. Uh, the second project I'm just going to mention briefly is this one, the British Museum Great Court Roof, the architects were Foster's, uh, Bureau Happold with the engineers and Wagner Bureau with the steel and glass contractors who um, had a tremendous uh, input into the design as well in the sense that the, uh, the nodal connections and so on, the, it's fully welded, uh, was developed very much in collaboration with them. Now, my work was basically mathematical in terms of defining the shape and writing the computer software to um, produce the information, which we then sent to Wagner Bureau, who then did a, a very large amount of, of extra computation in order to control their machine tools to machine the nodal connections and so on. Now, um, uh, it's a very difficult to know what, if anything, one should say about the, the theory of shell structures. Um, uh, and maybe that's something we can talk about later. Um, uh, so in, in a sense, we've actually got three strings to our bow. We've got um, computational analysis, we've got physical models, and we've also got um, analytical models, which were very important um, prior to the, um, the use of computers. So maybe we'll come back to that um, later. But I now want to talk about the past a bit and to, to look at projects from the past and maybe to try and ask the question, would they have been improved if they had the digital tools that we have at the moment? Um, so this is the uh, Grand Palais in Paris. And you can see that it's a, it's a fantastic space. Um, and if you know about these sort of things, you can see that there is a tremendous sort of rigor to the, the way in which this has been designed. And you can see that this is a very, you can imagine the person or the people sitting down and coming up with, up with this sort of design. Uh, using drawing boards, hand calculations, uh, and maybe physical models. Um, uh, Philippe has talked about stereotomy, and for many people, this building, the Hotel de Ville in Arles, is, is one of the, the most perfect examples. Uh, perhaps because it's so simple, um, when we look at something like that, again, we marvel that, that people were able to do this uh, without any digital tools. And um, it's something that we must have tremendous respect for. Um, this is the Anju Bridge in China, which is now um, uh, 1400, more than 1400 years old. Uh, and again, if you're interested in masonry bridges, and uh, the flow of forces, as Sigrid talked about, then you look at something like this, uh, the way that they've re re um, relieved the loading at the, uh, near the supports by those secondary arches um, is, is delightful. Um, I haven't got a picture of the Maidenhead Bridge by Brunel. Um, he overcame the same problem by essentially having more curvature in his arches as he got nearer the supports without the relieving arches. Um, uh, from an academic point of view, stereotomy is the, um, the art of cutting stones to, to make vaults and bridges and so on. Um, this picture on the right shows, uh, it's actually an ellipsoid um, and the lines on the drawing, which I've reproduced in red on the computer, 
are the principal curvature lines on, of the ellipsoid. Um, so clearly people back in those days had a very uh, good knowledge of differential geometry, which is the geometry of curves and surfaces. Um, and uh, particularly in France, but also in America, I think, um, young engineers and architects would have spent a tremendous amount of time learning about stereotomy, either for designing buildings or for designing masonry bridges. I uh, can't talk about this sort of thing without talking about um, Gaudi, um, and in particular, the Colonia Guel. Uh, this is the hanging model, again, exactly the same idea that, that Friotto used um, many years later. Um, and uh, here we have uh, another project by, by Gaudi, the Park Guell retaining walls. And you can see here that Gaudi, well, I assume it was Gaudi who did this drawing, but of course you can never be sure, um, using graphic statics, which Sigrid mentioned, uh, to, uh, to analyze uh, the thrust in, in this structure. Uh, num there are many other people who, who pioneered this sort of field. Uh, Felix Candela, who, who I met in Bath when he came to see Ted, Ted Happold. I guess it must have been in the 80s. Um, uh, Amancio Williams is not so well known, um, but I think these... Um, uh, concrete umbrellas are delightful in the sense that I think all of us tend to sort of do things which are very complicated to sort of show how clever we are but actually to do something as simple as this um, shows a real uh, knowledge and finesse. Um, one of my students in Sweden, Alex and I, are doing some work at the moment on this on this um, aqueduct by Toroja. Um, we could speak for a whole hour, I guess, just on the the way that this structure works. It's a shell structure. It's also a beam. It's an aqueduct. Uh, the more you learn about it, the more you realize quite how how elegant it is. Um, uh, so, and I think, I suppose one of the problems with the digital, as I said, is that it does tend to force one to perhaps overcomplicate things, whereas something like this is, is, is so simple and so pure. Um, we're doing some work at the moment trying to produce more organic forms um, for grid shells, but um, this is a project which never got built. So we're, we're, we live in hope on that one. Now, I sp one of the things I was thinking about as I was preparing this lecture was what, what is the opposite of the digital? I mean, obviously in terms of computers, you tend to think of digital computers and in the old days we had analog computers, but analog is not really the opposite of the digital. And I suppose for me, the problem with the digital is that it does, reduce a sort of disconnect between what you're doing and the way you think about it. So clearly this young girl riding her bike has a very uh, intimate relationship with her environment. Uh, she's clearly enjoying it. Whereas the digital, which, as I've sort of used this image of, a, of an SUV, in a sense gives you a, a a slight separation from what you're doing. Um, and uh, in the same way that the driver of a monstrosity like that would be essentially disconnected from, from the world around. Um, uh, but of course, having said that, computers are very, very useful in all sorts of ways. And uh, the main thing is to actually use them in ways that we enjoy and ways that improve the environment for, for everybody. And I'm gonna finish now just by talking about a slightly different topic, which is fluid mechanics. So um, this is an image that I produced a few years ago now, probably about 10 years ago. So 
I wrote the software using a technique called SPH. Uh, fluid mechanics is a lot more difficult than structures. Um, and you can see how even a very, very simple uh, physical situation, which in this case is a flag in the wind, produces through turbulence and shedding of vortices, an incredibly complex uh, situation. And even now, and probably for the foreseeable future, maybe forever, computers will never really be able to um, simulate exactly how fluids will behave. Um, and just to finish off, there are two recent things that have happened, which in a sense we have to relate back to the digital. Uh, most people of course are aware of the um, Boeing 737 MAX. Um, and the problem with that was that basically it was a flawed design, the, the, the fundamental design of the aircraft in terms of the proportions and so on. Uh, because they wanted to try and put bigger engines onto a, an airframe that, that couldn't take them. Um, and so they used computer software to um, account for, or to stop pilots stalling the aircraft. Um, uh, because they thought the pilots wouldn't be able to cope with the bad behavior of the aircraft. Um, and then through a combination of software perhaps and, and hardware problems that caused those, those two uh, aircraft to crash. Grenfell Tower has had a tremendous influence in the UK on the way that people think. Um, it's a problem with fluid mechanics in the sense that, that fire essentially is, is, is like a fluid. It, it heat of the flames causes fluid to rise and so on. Um, but it made us realize that actually uh, things are much more complicated than, well, in some ways they're more complicated, in some ways they're much simpler. Um, the simple answer is that it was ridiculous that that, uh, that sort of cladding should have been put on this building. But the problem was essentially that the regulations were too complicated. There were financial pressures on contractors and so on. And also from our point of view, from a point of view, well, I'm actually an engineer, but from the education of architects, uh, in the UK, there's very much a disconnect between the education of architects and the physical realization of buildings, how buildings are put together, um, how do you make them safe, and so on. Um, and that's a, a perennial problem, I think, uh, in terms of, of, of architecture. How do you balance safety and competence on the one hand um, against uh, flair and intellectual um, uh, honesty or whatever on the other hand. So I think I'll stop now and hopefully we'll now, I guess, have some sort of discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for Chris. So I'll, I should stop sharing my screen, okay. I guess. <laughs> yes. Except my mouse seems to have gone to sleep. Completely. I think, uh, yeah. Please give us a very interesting, very interesting comments actually to digital futures, um, uh, which is actually a platform. We make a discussion right now. We 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 we, we emphasize uh, ourselves as an Anthropocene um, age uh, on the Earth, and especially rethinking on. Uh, why digital and how digital and uh, the digital futures, what the digital future should be. I think um, um, uh, because all the guests today here is very, uh, you, you have all, all have very strong background as structure engineer, but uh, we, at the same time, um, uh, that's why we, uh, we are, uh, most of us here, the, the, the guests here are architects. I think uh, the collaboration and integration between architects and uh, structure engineer is actually very, very right now is very popular, not only academic area, but also in the practical process. So the first question I think I want to ask um, is um, relationship between architects and engineers, Sigrid, Philip and Chris um, are all actually play a very important leader, leading roles um, um, globally. So I, I want to know your thinking on education 
um, background because right now we define our education uh, by different kind of uh, departments from architect departments and structure and engineer departments. And in different school, actually we define the, the boundary of our career very clearly. But actually when we're talking about uh, the, the why we, we make certain kind of shell structure is goes to maybe more efficient, um, save energy, save material and uh, make the material intelligence play more important roles in the future. So this kind of collaboration should be set up. So I want to know your thinking on um, how we should go and uh, uh, why we should make, make certain kind of research from different, different um, uh, uh, perspective. So Philip, uh, would you like to say something on that? <laughs> okay, I, I can get going, but this, uh, this is a question that uh, can open an entire can of worms. And so this might be the only topic we talk about because, um, uh, yeah, the, the mismatch between what we show and or how we approach our projects and then indeed education is, is, is really dramatic, I would say. And I, I noticed this also in my home university at, at ETH Zurich that there is also a lot of resistance uh, towards uh, uh, different models where actually the typical kind of um, the um, actors are being questioned and we are trying to kind of bring all of these people together. I think to me, it's, all, it's obvious. It's, I think it's also obvious in, in everything that we do that I believe that you have to bring all of these people together. And I also strongly believe that it's not just the architects and engineers, but it's like what Chris says, it's uh, bringing actually how things are done much closer and much more prominent in the education. So I would say that indeed fabrication and construction and and actually also just economics and, and like how, uh, how does that all, all relate to the realities of the real world. So I see all of these things kind of lacking in, in, um, in, in, in education. Um, to me, it's quite frustrating. I, I, I prepared an entire master program that, that proposes uh, to bring uh, a new type of, uh, and I would, I would maybe, I would like to start talking about designers or kind of or builders or another term so that's uh, because i want to make it crystal clear that i think that the separation of an architect and an engineer is already um, a wrong starting point it's all an author of a project with different aspects to that project and so i think that that to me is kind of the key thing we need to go forward if we do this through computation if we do this through kind of um training people to be part of a team. Uh, so there's, there's many models that I can imagine, but what we need to do is to get also rid, rid of this, this absurd hierarchy between an architect that seems to be able to decide all kinds of things without, uh, without the, the, the expertises of everyone downstream uh, really uh, properly uh, included. So, um, Sorry, this is a long answer. As you know, Philip, I, I would argue that computation could be the glue that brings all these people together. But more important, it's just kind of already uh, training everyone to be a team member in a bigger bigger team is, is, is maybe the most important aspect, I think. Great. So uh, I think um, the end of uh, Chris's uh, uh, lecture, you put forward actually a very interesting question, actually um, the relationship between the, the human and the uh, digital. I think that's, uh, I want to ask you, because Neil, Neil Leach is here. Uh, would you like to make some comments or set up some discussion on this topic? Uh, you know, I, I, to be honest, I think what we, we've always spoken about uh, cyborgs and things and, um, I personally sort of see it in that time relationship, uh, the use of other AI or the use of computation as a kind of um, an extension of the, the, the imagination of the individual. Um, uh, so I don't necessarily see it as kind of like a either or, I think we have to see it as kind of working, uh, working together. Um, but uh, all I could say is I'm just blown away by the presentations today. It's fabulous to see uh, these things. It's fabulous to see uh, such an, an amazing, um, uh, uh, turn out to be uh, audience here. Um, no, I, I, I don't. I don't see it as opposition, oppositional. In fact, actually, my work. A lot of my work is is really about trying to see what 
computation and what AI can tell us about how we ourselves operate. And uh, increasingly, I see that's the case. I mean, both in the way that uh, Craig Reynolds um, uh, was able, we were able, was allowed us to understand how birds flock and the behavior and so on of birds by modeling those things. I think increasingly now we're beginning to get insights into how we think by using AI. So I don't see it in those oppositional ways, but I completely understand what Chris was saying about that. Thank you. So as um, you're talking about cyber, because it's kind of uh, the truth as kind of extension of human intelligence. And as the history of the shell structure, we can see uh, from the hanging chain model um, that is actually totally pre-digital uh, to Hans um, uh, Insulus model, and also including Free Auto, the grid shell uh, project, then, then goes to um, uh, Philip Rock, uh, you develop uh, TNA and, and Renovat. And actually you're talking about, uh, uh, and also the world is right now very interesting, the camp compass, especially uh, not only in the States, but also in, in, in Asia and China. Uh, the, the compass really um, attractive and really uh, meaningful actually, because you set, set up a kind of um, open source uh, platform that is a sharing platform for the new knowledge. And as a, uh, the knowledge from the structure engineer, actually this kind of choose is implemented not only by the structure engineer, but most of the users actually are the architects. So I think uh, the new tools platform becomes and plays more important roles is as a tension extension of the human intelligence because the tools can really help the the uh, it's not a post rationalized process as a structure engineer done before but it's like uh, engage into design process of early decision making process to the architects. So I think uh, uh, as a PhD program, we, we have PhD program here uh, in Shanghai and also uh, New Age is right now develop an um, international PhD program globally. I think uh, this kind of two development, two, two based development is really more, more and more important as a, as a kind of integration and collaboration between different kinds of um, uh, careers, different kinds of background. So I want to know your opinion and attitude to to develop uh, this kind of design tools of shells. So what's the next uh, for the, the, the shell research? So Secret, would you like to say something because what your research is really interesting, yeah. Right, yeah. So um, well, I've recently started working with uh, machine learning uh, algorithms. Um, I think what's interesting there is to see whether we can give the, the robots through the machine learning algorithms, whether they can be creative or whether they can be creative uh, together with humans. So I'm, I'm working on a project with that. But be, that being said, I am very much also for the physical and the touching because I think if we go too much cyber, then we really lose intuitive um, knowledge. And uh, Philip, I wanna come back to a question that you asked earlier about like, how do we uh, teach that? I, I maybe wanna, I, uh, go back in time from when I was a student when I was 18 I went to Bath University where uh, Chris was teaching and that program and actually the head of the school was uh, Ted Hubble so he really understood that architects and engineers have to work together and so uh, I went so he, he was the head of the department and um, the program was such that in the first year the engineers and the architects were together. Actually, I did not know the, my friends whether they had signed up for architecture or um, engineering. It was only in the second year that you had to say, I'm gonna do architecture or engineering. So I signed up for um, engineering. We had in that first year, a lot of uh, project design as engineers and project work. And that kind of continued through in, throughout the entire bachelor degree. But also um, in the, I think the second or the third year, as engineers, uh, we had we took courses in uh, sculpting, and I think that was Chris actually who set that up. He set up, uh, you know, this wonderful opportunity to um, <clears throat> work with your hands, work with plaster and fabric, and see how things hang. And that really caused an aha moment when the mind and the hands kind of connect. If you see you're doing stuff with your hands, you are feeling the forces, you're feeling the resistance, you feel the form kind. That I think really, really adds to your understanding. You know, very often I have seen 
um, students of mine or in workshops, you know, use all kinds of digital tools and produce shells and see blue and red uh, parts, which is supposed to be tension and compression, and then they go to on to the next time without really an understanding of how, what does this mean? Is this even the, the right result that you put gravity upwards as opposed to downwards? Is this what you're supposed to? And so I think it's very, you know, although we, can, we are going down the road of machine learning and, you know, robots and stuff, I think we can only do that if we understand fundamentally how shell structures work. And there's different ways of doing that. You know, you can study um, courses like plates and shells, which I teach, but also I think the physical experience of either working with your hands or I, 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 uh, I found it very interesting that Philip said that when they demolished the, I think it was the first or the second um, shell that they had the confidence that they thought, okay, we know this by the computers that this works, but now that we're hacking this with very large hammers and it's not falling apart, that gives us confidence that we can do this at the larger scale. And so if, if maybe they hadn't had that experience, you know, maybe they would have been more hesitant to go larger scale. And so I think, um, you know, the future is definitely digital, definitely robotic, definitely uh, machine learning. But I think we can only do that if we have a fundamental understanding. And one of them, I think, is intuitive knowledge, which we get through doing things with our hands, um, feeling how things uh, resist things or how they keep, you know, stay together when they collapse. Um, and so I think that is, as, as educators, and, you know, Philip says it's not, not always so easy because, you know, we cannot totally decide um, all the courses that we would like to teach. But, you know, that is something that I would like to see in the curriculum that um, both architects and engineers get a more um, you know, a, a deeper understanding of how structures work through making stuff, through, you know, like testing stuff with their hands and seeing how they collapse or how they, um, I don't know, how they resist with the bending active structures. You can do that very well, right? You, you bend the thing, you feel, wow, I have to put a tie here, it's just gonna like splay out. So uh, I think the future is digital, but with, with a big kind of uh, caveat that, you know, it cannot only be digital. I think. Okay. I think uh, we can uh, make it even further and uh, based on the what's secretly talking about the digital because uh, right now actually as for example as uh, uh, the shell structure design actually which go more beyond uh, what we we, we we were thinking or, or define as a digital because we, we make a lot of discussion to, for the further um, uh, uh, algorithm or different methodology uh, which engage into uh, developing different tools uh, in the shell uh, structure design. For example, the architects always uh, offer uh, for some diversity, but uh, the, all, all of this kind of shell structure form finding uh, give us um, uh, a special uh, answer uh, because which is an uh, optimal form uh, based on different kind of software. But actually, the architects normally, uh, from the sketch or from their thinking, uh, from their uh, design thinking, the form is have a, a certain kind of difference to this kind of uh, uh, form finding process, because you set up a lab form finding. So how? Uh, so I want to ask you, how would you like to define this kind of form finding tools or computational tools? Um, can and collaborate with different kind of human intelligence their creativity uh, in the design process. How would you like to set up this kind of connection? Yeah, so I, th I think the, word, uh, the, uh, the explanation is the, in the word form finding itself, right? So it's finding a form. It, it means that there is no pre-described geometry. It's not like, oh, we're gonna do a hemisphere or we're gonna do this kind of shape. What you can, so there are of course all these algorithms, solvers or methods like uh, TNA that generate a form. But you as a designer still have to put in parameters. And that's really where your creativity comes in. If you know how to use these tools very well, whether it's physical tools, hanging chain models, or it's digital tools, uh, you still have to decide you know, the, the top, topology. How are all the members connected? Um, how elastic do I make my model? Where are the, you know, what kind of boundary conditions do I use? Do I put in uh, sliders or fixed points? So actually, as a designer, you have to be creative in or the creativity lies in determining the parameters that influence the form finding process. But 
you don't determine what the geometry is. That's what the form finding process does itself. So actually, um, although you know these form finding tools are very widely um, available now, if you want to do something very specific, if you're a designer, say you know I want my shell to come out like this, and you know it has to be high here, and you know like all the members have to be oriented like this. You actually have to know how to do that. You actually have to know how to manipulate the form finding process. So there is really, I think, a kind of craftsmanship or a kind of mastery of uh, form finding techniques, whether they're physical or um, <laughs> definitely analytical. I mean, very few people know how to do that analytically. Maybe Chris and Bill Baker know how to, and the, um, Alan McCrovey, um, they know how to do that, but very few people how, know how to do this uh, analytically. But anyway, so you have, if you can easily generate forms, but if you are a designer and you want a specific form or you want to control that process, that is really a, a craft. I think, and that is where the creativity comes in. How do you get something out that, you know, that's what you want. You want this kind of design. Not it's it, the tool is not going on a ride with you, but you are actually controlling it. And just like you know, at the time with the the craftsman people, you know, well, we can all hammer, but but you know, to make a, a beautiful sculpture, you have to be very um, fairly skillful, right? And you have to know how uh, you have to know how to use your tools in a really good way. Uh, and I see that in, in that way, that, that it's, these are really just tools and, uh, you know, you have to learn how to, you have to either make them yourself or you have to learn how to use them um, and to understand them really well so that you really understand well the final thing that you come up with, that's what you wanted and that the tools haven't just led you to a shape that you then will build. Yeah, good. Um, I think several years ago, uh, I visited uh, Stuttgart and Achim, Achim Angus, he drive me around all the way to Multi Hall and I, I, I take the, my first visit uh, of this great building. I think uh, at that time, without any computer, but only by this kind of physical model uh, form finding process, um, uh, Chris and you working with um, Ferry Auto, to design this very complicated great building, actually, maybe in the design process, you imagine maybe not such a long um, uh, uh, existing uh, period for this building, maybe just a few years. But right now, it's more than forty or fifty years, I think, uh, for this great building, shell building. It's all made by the small timber, uh, multi layers crossing each other. So that's a great, very efficient um, system, actually, which only gener only generate by this kind of physical mode, uh, form finding process. And I think uh, uh, right now we have very uh, very strong computational tools actually to to generate different kind of form to prove different kind of um, uh, asymmetrical uh, shell st structure by the. Uh, the computational simulation. So I want to ask uh, um, uh, in, in free auto uh, design, uh, maybe you engage a lot of, for the process, could you introduce or could you tell us what's the, the key difference between this kind of two methodologies right now uh, uh, compares to 50 years or, or 60 years ago uh, when you make the design for such a great building? Well, um, it's, it's quite difficult to answer that question in a, in a short time. Um, uh, I think in, in the past, before, before we had digital tools, then um, young engineers, old engineers, young architects, old architects all spoke the same language. There is a slight problem now that there is a disconnect between, I guess, normally sort of 20 somethings who are really shit hot at grasshopper and rhino and stuff like that on the one hand, and the older engineers and architects who've got experience who perhaps don't really understand at all what the younger ones are doing. Um, uh, I suppose in, 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 in all designs, the, the, the um, and this is not just now, but in the past forever, the design has been in two parts. One was a sort of conceptual part where you decide um, what it is that you, you, you want to design, the basic form of the 
bridge or the building or whatever, or the aircraft or whatever it is. And that is quite fun and quite sort of fluid and lots of sort of toing and froing and stuff. And then there's a much more detailed part, which is basically where engineers tend to come in, which is to try and show that, um, you know, the wings aren't gonna fall off the aeroplane or that the building isn't gonna collapse and so on. And in the case of Mannheim, Arabs were involved in the design actually quite late. There originally were some German engineers appointed, but they sort of found it a bit too difficult. And so Fry came to TED. And our role there was basically to, to uh, analyze the structure, do all the drawings and stuff, um, and to try and show that this very, very slender structure would be safe. And um, uh, essentially the problem with Mannheim that we predicted then and the problem that the structure has experienced is a phenomenon known as creep buckling, which is where over a long period of time, the timber um, slowly bends. And so the shape of the structure is now not as good as it was when it was first built. And there's a big problem there because there's a big lack of knowledge um, about or predicting the, the actual material properties of the timber in terms of long-term creep um, and then incorporating those properties into the software. And most, most software is pretty crap, to be honest. Um, or you should, it's always safe to assume that software is crap until sort of you've been able to demonstrate the, the opposite. And even now, I think we would struggle to get the material properties and also to model um, the long-term creep buckling of, of timber. Um, so, I guess the digital has, has helped it with all these things, um, uh, but it's still, we still have to be aware of, you know, what happened with the 737, uh, what happened with uh, Grenfell and so on. And essentially that is uh, what engineers do, but they don't talk about it quite so much with architects because it's a bit embarrassing <laughs> that's, that's basically why engineers are such miserable people you see Philip because we have to be we have to be pessimists and assume that the sky is going to fall on our heads as happens in Asterix so it's um, I think there are these two phases there's the exploration there's the sort of um, playing around with digital stuff and so on on the one hand and then there's the sort of grown-up stuff of showing that whatever you've done is going to survive if say a lorry drives into it or, you know, there's a bomb explosion or, or something, um, which Sigrid mentioned briefly in terms of resilience of, of structures. Um, and what tends to happen is that uh, people perhaps don't worry sufficiently about these sorts of things. And then there's the disaster and then they start worrying about them. And then 20 years go by and they didn't worry about them so much. Um, and the same thing applies, I guess, in all sorts of areas. So at the moment, the Americans have just averted a, a disaster in terms of their political system. And that was because their political system was sufficiently robust to resist the attack from, from the right. And um, I guess in the digital age, that again is something we have to be careful of, um, uh, basically understanding how people behave and make sure that we don't get too far along the wrong, the wrong, the wrong line. I'm sorry, that's, that was a bit rambling and it didn't really, I'm not sure if it answered your question at all. <laughs> um, but I think there is certainly a disconnect in the sense that for most of my work, I actually have been working using software that I wrote myself. So I know exactly what the software can and can't do. What's very difficult, I think, if you're a user of software is to, to know how, how reliable that software is in terms of predicting the future. If you speak to a person and you ask their advice, then we're, most of us are quite good at evaluating that person's advice. We think, well, that person seems to know what they're talking about. They seem to be quite a, a decent person, quite reliable and so on. But software is much more difficult. Um, software may contain all sorts of bugs. Um, it may produce wrong answers sometimes. So um, we, we have to be, 
we have to be quite cynical about it, I think. Um, uh, but at the same time, of course, our everyday lives relies increasingly on all sorts of electronic stuff, iPhones, um, computers, um, the internet, and so on. Uh, and of course, at the moment, Zoom, which is the only way, uh, Zoom and other platforms, which is the only way that we can communicate with each other. Good, good. I think that's uh, a Philippe. very interesting point. Uh, so I want to ask uh, Philip Rock, uh, because well, you develop a version two for Renovote and actually, a lot of people give critics, actually, the users give, give a lot of uh, critics to version one, uh, RhinoVault version one, because um, a lot of um, different load, a different kind of uh, boundary conditions we're adding to the software. And also, um, as Chris mentioned, the, 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 the process of builders and also the uh, the crafts actually how to make to define the, the the load and how to define the condition of the construction process. So, what do you think about software? Can this kind of computational tools solve all these kind of questions? Yeah, I, I, actually, I was going to comment uh, exactly this and, and tying a little bit uh, Sigrid's and 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 uh, and and Chris's uh, comments together because I think indeed we um, thanks to. Uh, software tools and very approachable software tools uh, like like Grasshopper and the like. Um, I think they were very important and they are very they were very good at at opening up and showing that uh, other other things are possible. And so they they started to actually demonstrate uh, hints at why we how we could extend our knowledge through the digital. And so. When you ask about what's next for shells and so on, for me, actually, what's next is not to go beyond what Sigrid was saying. So to go beyond actually uh, understanding the parameters of the tools and so on, but actually to, through your experience in, in, in using tools, for example, to actually start to abstract and distill and to rediscover somehow what master builders in the past knew. Because for example, it's, it's remarkable to look at a calculation of Heinz Eisler. He just does his calculation on a one pager because certain things for him are obvious. For example, that if you have sufficient double curvature for his uh, compression shells, synclastic kind of shells, then actually anything will work. You don't need to know exactly how the forces go because one, you probably don't know exactly how the forces in the real structure go. And if you have sufficient double curvature and you pay particular attention to the boundary conditions, so you support your shell properly, then actually anything with, the, with a lot of double curvature will work. And actually I have to admit that now me and my team, we don't use our own tools anymore. We just actually, make sure that there is sufficient double curvature because we know at the end, once we need to then uh, demonstrate this to others, we actually then maybe generate a closest fit TNA solution and, and, and then we do an FE analysis and we show that the shell is super stiff and so on, but no surprise for us because actually the core geometrical principle behind it is what made this shell work, for example, right? And what I'm trying to, to, to make here as a point is exactly what Chris was saying is that you can be blinded uh, from all these sophisticated looking tools and so on and, 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 and forget actually the core, pr uh, the core principles, which can be very, very simple indeed. And so for me, what is the future for, for or why what I learned from starting by looking at shell structures is actually the importance of robust and good geometry. And that relates also to the last comments that Chris was were making. Is, and that is also the very big difference, in my opinion, between form finding and then the real design. And design includes also checking all these other loading cases, the extreme loads, the, the, the connection details, and so on. For me, the big difference is actually uh, um, uh, if you get past the step of form finding, then you actually will never get stuck in geometries that are very sensitive to other loading cases, because actually these principles already were inherent in how you approach it and so on. You will also, for example, not make a shell where if you hit one stone out, I get this as a question uh, in my lectures all the time. Like if you take this stone out, does that mean that everything 
collapses. Well, luckily not, right? That is exactly what design means. And so I think uh, you will only get to that step if you understand the principles. And there was a comment in the chat, uh, someone that said that the glue between all of us is indeed geometry. And, and using these tools, and like Sigrid shows in her research, to actually, again, show through, through um, parametric studies and so on, to, to distill there the key principles that really matters, amplitude, uh, 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 and, and, and kind of also she has these hinge lines to make it statically so, uh, uh, more determinate so that we have this three hinge arch kind of logic so that we can control the force flow and so on and so on. And so, uh, I think we want to use, we, now we need to go beyond just using tools. We need to use our tools, these approaches, these strategies to really get back to the key insights that matter. And then to, uh, sorry, this is again a long answer, but then to tie it back to, to indeed your comment about Compass, that is also a, com a comment that I wanted to make because open source is not just about freely sharing things. Open source is also about exposing how you have done things. So basically, and that is indeed the big difference between Rhino Vault 1, which was a plugin. You can just drag it into a software tool and then you can do whatever the plugin allows. Rhino Vault 2 is a framework that extends or that is built upon Compass. So you can actually see how everything has been implemented. You can also change the algorithms. You can actually change the assumptions. You can change the loading cases and so on and so on. So I find uh, software a dangerous kind of uh, term because software uh, tends to suggest a closed um, black box kind of thing where you have to accept uh, the logic of whoever set up that software, I think it will be much more important indeed to have open source so and also open visible computational frameworks that allow you really to understand everything uh, uh, in the hood. So everything behind uh, the scenes and so on. And again, that is the spirit behind Compass, you know this. Uh, and it's a, it's a big struggle. It's uh, many, many, many years of development. I think we're slowly getting there. But uh, to me, that is absolutely the way forward. For, and, and particularly for all the reasons that Chris said, that otherwise uh, we are just being blinded and we are probably not fully understanding the problem. Good, very good. Neil, please. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Philip. Uh, and thank you for this fantastic set of presentations, really wonderful. Um, I just wanted to raise a kind of almost a philosophical question. Um, as you know, last year, uh, Philip and I uh, published a book, uh, Architectural Intelligence, and uh, we wrote a, an introduction about this as a kind of, I guess, a, a new kind of paradigm, a new way of thinking, um, how intelligence has to be applied to all sorts of domains, to, especially now to environmental issues and so on, uh, and obviously structural concerns, um, mainly because this has kind of become an ethical imperative in a world of diminishing resources and so on, that we need to find intelligent ways of operating. For this summer, we've just launched um, a call for papers for digital futures and we've called it material intelligence um, and uh, that's kind of raises a lot of issues about structure and so on but the, re the, the real question though is really can we use the term material intelligence I mean are materials actually intelligent or should we refer to it as the intelligent use of materials so it's a kind of like a philosophical question but uh, working with I guess what I, I want to go back to, to, to a point where um uh, Chris and I, a long time ago, 2003, I think it was, uh, uh, organized a, a conference at the University of Bath on digital tectonics. There was Mark Barry there, there was, there was uh, Chris, obviously, there was um, uh, Greg Lynn came, Cecil Bauman and so on. And one comment that Manuel Delanda made uh, at that conference, which I think was a beautiful kind of uh, comment, he said, I feel like I'm surrounded by a group of material philosophers. And I always think of, of engineers as material philosophers. But you know, can we use the expression material intelligence and to what extent can we use that? So it's a bit of a philosophical question for you guys. We, we, uh, yes, we just kick off the-, the I can try and answer topic. that. Yeah, please, please. Okay, so when I was at school, we had a very good mathematics teacher who when he was introducing a new topic, would say, this is all I know about this topic. And he would just tell us one or two facts. And then, in fact, then he would talk for you know an hour or two hours about more stuff, more detailed stuff. 
But basically, everything was encapsulated in those simple facts. And I think what intelligence does is it takes the very complicated world around us and explains it in a, using simple ideas, simple models. Um, and that's what structural models are. And I don't know whether you can see this, for example. This is a half a football and it behaves, it's very flexible, behaves in a certain way. And if you um, attach it to a support like this, it becomes very, very stiff. And that's a very, very, very simple concept. Um, and if you understand that, and in a sense, you understand all there is to know about shell structures. Software is obviously very, very useful in, in predicting what will happen in the world and in interpreting the world. But uh, software can, it can provide a barrier, if you like, to, to, to thinking. Um, and ideally, I suppose, is that you take these two things together. You, you take your animal intelligence, your human intelligence, and you um, uh, use that in conjunction with the software. And also, as Neil says, with the um, possible intelligence of the material or the intelligent use of, of the material. Um, uh, the difficulty, I think, with a lot of this is it's actually very easy to... to um, come up with different answers. So I've done, worked on buildings in timber and buildings in steel. And people say, well, should you use timber or should you use steel? And, you know, on, from the ecological point of view, you might say, well, timber is much more sustainable, et cetera, et cetera, uh, than steel, but it's, it's perhaps you can't recycle it. You can recycle steel, you can't really recycle timber. Uh, steel is a superior structural material. Um, so uh, as PhD students and I, Dragos, um, did a study and we came to the conclusion that the best thing to do was to burn the timber and to use the energy from burning the timber to, to melt the steel. I mean, that was a bit tongue in cheek because, you know, timber has this sort of very environmentally friendly um, uh, reputation. Um, uh, but it is, very, it, is very, it is very difficult in terms of sustainability to, to know what is sustainable. You know, you might have a car, which is very big and heavy and so on, but it's a battery car, electric car, and therefore people say, oh, it's that's very environmentally friendly. But of course, it's got lots of material in making the car and making the battery. So I think um, trying to answer Neil's point, it's interesting to, answer, to ask questions, but it's very difficult to, to answer them. Thank you. <laughs> Good. I think uh, it's a great... Uh, uh, talks today and also great um, fantastic uh, lectures you put forward and especially Philip Rock, I, I, I actually audited in your lecture several times five six times but today is quite different I think I like it very much and also we admire all, all of you um, for a long time and also a uh, secret I think secret last uh, Acadia workshop your your workshop is is one of the best <laughs> And globally, we, we notice it's really interesting, not only on the shell structure, but also the collaborative robotics actually engage totally into the, the fabrica fabrication process. That's great. Um, so we're looking forward um, um, to invite you, uh, if you like, um, in the future to teach in our future workshops. That is globally um, influential every year. Uh, I think uh, this platform, Digital Futures, actually is kind of free uh, research platform and actually uh, uh, different um, uh, every Saturday we have different topic uh, that is really open and great thanks to all you guys <laughs> coming to join us and uh, we have a lot audience I think more than 5,000 tonight um, in Bilibili I don't know how, how many in on, on, on YouTube. So I think, uh, uh, and more and more people can, 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 can see all the, the video time by time. So I think that will be a great um, like TED model, actually very short, like 20 minutes um, talk, but the uh, students actually, or researchers actually, actually they, can, they, can, they can see your video time by time and learning a lot by that. I, I just very appreciate for your contribution on this platform. So thank you so much. Uh, for your uh, uh, participant. And Philip, uh, long time no see. Uh, so we're look, looking forward to inviting you to come in. Uh, after yeah. the, the post-pandemic, <laughs> we have not seen each other more than one year, right? 
So yeah, no, it's crazy, <laughs> Philip. We miss you. Yeah, I miss yeah, you. I miss, you so I, much. I miss our really great times in Shanghai. We we cannot wait to come back. Yes. Uh, yeah, but thanks so a lot have, for, the, uh, for the invitation yeah. and the opportunity, uh, both Philip yeah, and Neil. This is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think um, uh, we have a Digital Future Award, and one of the most important award is named by Matthias um, uh, Ripman uh, for the memorial uh, of Matthias' yeah, contribution to Rhine Award. So, mm -hmm. and next year we we'll still have the Digital Future Award coming. And welcome to um, to to introduce or to engage into the, the the voting process. So thank you so much for all your participation, Chris. Very nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Philip. See great. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you so bye -bye. much. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks for joining. Yeah. Bye. Ciao.